Hello, postdoc scholars and friends. I am Rosemary Anderson, and I'm speaking to you from my home in Southern Oregon. Today, I'd like to speak about Suzanne Gutbreuder's developmental model and my own speculations. To begin, I'd like to thank Suzanne Gutbreuder because the precision and clarity of her model, together with it being empirically based, allows me as a researcher of 40 plus years to respond very clearly and precisely and advance my own ideas. This is a terrific compliment to Suzanne Cook Breuder that she actually inspires me and probably other people to think more concretely and creatively. Thank you very much, Suzanne. I'd also like to invite everyone who listens to this recording to listen with your body. There are things that can be understood, basically absorbed through resonance and listening to the words of another person or, and watching them that cannot be easily understood by the mind. There are subtleties that the body picks up that the mind cannot. And so I want to invite everyone listening to this recording to listen with your body. What does listening with your body mean? It means you're listening to the changes inside your body and also the changes as you experience your skin resonating with the words or the muscles underlying your skin. These give you all kinds of signals, both from the viscera or the gut and other organs within the body, and also signals um, from the skin and the tissues of the body as what I would call a tympanic membrane, like a drum. I also want to mention something about my own life experience that allows me to think in I think different ways than a lot of other developmental theorists. Since I have been doing quantitative analysis for 40 plus years, I'm a researcher, and I've been doing quantitative analysis for 40 some years and qualitative for about 25. The analysis of data, particularly quantitative data, forces a statistician to think at least in three, if not four and five dimensional terms, visually and spatially, visio-spatially as it's called. This practice, or shall we say expertise, allows me to think in dimensionality that has visual and spatial dynamics to it. So when I think about development as it progresses over time, in any one human being and in society in general or culture in general, human culture, I can think about it exponentially or multiplicatively that, or algorithmically, that each stage of development not only transcends and includes the stages below it, but expands mathematically. And if one thinks in these terms, it's a lot easier to think about development rather than to think, just simply think about it as one stage sort of piled up on top of another. Actually, it's a stage, then a stage, then a stage, then a stage, then a stage you know, it just goes big, 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 bigger, okay? So I wanna say that to begin with, to invite you to think in these particular ways. The fact that Suzanne Kupreuter's model is empirically based is a tremendous advantage and a great contribution to the field of human development. There are others that have used empirically based data uh, to develop models. Piaget is, you know, obvious example, but there are, are there are certainly others. Suzanne Kupreuter's model is based on her analysis of Jane Lovinger's sentence completeness, the MAT, and 
the individual basically taking the test, the assessment, responds to a series of short uh, phrases or words and then um, answers these phrases or words by completing the sentence, if you will. This is essentially a, a uh, projective technique of a particular type, and it's a very good technique. It is language-based, and that is its inherent limitation as well. All research methods have methodological restraints or limitations. And the limitation of this particular um, method of sentence completion is that it is essentially language-based. Therefore, you can't analyze or get, because you can't get data, which is, set, is essentially outside of language. That is why at, in the final stages, Cook-Roder is not able to, to make fine discriminations uh, at the more mature levels of development because at a certain point in development, one goes beyond meaning making, beyond language. So there are no words. So a method that depends on words and a theory of ego development that depends on language, linguistic attributes, is going to inherently be limited in this way. She and others like myself are going to have to use other methods in order to describe the, the fine gradations at higher levels of spiritual maturity. And there are. I know from my own experience with some of my own teachers, and to some extent my own experience as a witness of my own, that there are fine gradations that occur at the higher levels of spiritual maturity. And these can be described. I describe some of them in what I call the body map, uh, my own model of psycho-spiritual development. Future videos will talk about my own map of spiritual development. I also want to thank Suzanne Kuchreuter for saying very clearly that narcissism is embedded or inherent and even more typical at higher levels of spiritual development. This is my experience having been in the field of transpersonal psychology a long time, uh, I have experienced a lot of spiritual teachers. And there is the liability or the shadow in spiritual development of narcissism, of overestimating one's own capacity, even far beyond what others attribute to one. Another point of difference between Suzanne Krupp Reuter and my work is the use of the word embodiment. Embodiment is not just action or feelings. Suzanne Cook Reuter does analyze actions, feelings, and events using the sentence completion responses of her participants. But embodiment for me is something very different as I alluded to in my opening remarks. Embodiment has to do with the the beingness in the body as one experiences the world. It's what I would call resonance within and in response to others and to nature and the environment in general. So the embodiment of a human being is a very big phenomenon, actually. It's within and it's without, and it is about resonance, both within and without. It is inherently relationship oriented or relational in its capacity, embodiment. It's not just my little embodiment, it's my embodiment as I experience you and the world and trees and plants and everything else. So this is a very important distinction between Suzanne Krupp Reuter's model and my own, the body map, because indeed I I look at human development from the point of the body. What happens at each stage of development inside the body as it responds within itself and to the outer world and to relationships?
One of the things about Suzanne Cook Reuter's model that makes it unusual is that it is a particularly good diagnostic tool. In other words, of all the models I know, it can be used both by an individual to, to understand themselves and to further their own spiritual growth, but also it can be used to help them interact with others and it, in a clinical setting or a teaching setting to evaluate other people's level of development. I simply don't know another model that is as explicit. And here, the, wor the words that uh, Suzanne Kuchbroder has extracted from her participants allow her to describe them in ways that other people can understand them easily. And this is the advantage of using language and words as the basis for developing a model. One of the things that is challenging about Suzanne Cook Broder's model for me is that it does not include at the higher levels of spiritual development, of just human development, mature development, the liabilities, the, the vulnerabilities or the challenges that are inherent to each one of those stages. Perhaps her participants don't reveal that information, but I know from my own experience with teachers and in my own life that as one progresses spiritually, you are, one becomes more vulnerable to the environment and to other people's opinion. Social situations become more difficult. At very high stages of development, as I've only been able to observe them in, a, in a, a stage I call merging with cosmos, merging with cosmos. At that stage of development, there is almost, a, you know, a, such a gap between one's consciousness and the other people around oneself that communication can become very challenging. And it isn't just that one becomes lonely because being lonely is not really something people at that stage worry about or are concerned about, but that one becomes isolated uh, from the, the social and you know, socio-historical situation in which one lives. And, and one can't really do that in the 21st century. We, we need to be engaged. And and reading the newspaper doesn't really give us enough. We need to be engaged with other people and circumstances. And this becomes very challenging at the very high levels. And eventually I will talk more about that on these videos, but um, I'm, I'm very certain that there are challenges uh, at these higher stages that are not been explicit or clarified in, in hardly any of the developmental models. The only things I see at the higher stages of the developmental models are, you know, defenses or things like that. But if you keep it limited like that, actually the defenses go down because there's nothing to be defended about if you don't have an ego. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, so that's not going to, that's not going to work very well. What the challenges are more about living in the world. And if you're not in a monastery, that can be a problem. In monasteries, people are taking care of you. That's the job of having an attendant, which is typical of people in monasteries. So these are the um, among the challenges that I see in Suzanne Crook Broder's model. One of the th one of the things, one of the things I'd like to thank her for, in particular, is her um, taking up with what Jane Lovinger uh, initially said, is that later, sta later stages are not necessarily more adapted or happier. In fact, they aren't happier or more adapted, in my experience, as well. Um, one progresses in spiritual development, but that doesn't mean you're more adapted to the world, as I just said. And also, you're not necessarily happier. You're just more spiritually 
advanced. And as Suzanne and Jane Levinger said, one stage is not better than another. It is simply different. And I think that's absolutely true. Kukrider also talks about variability at the higher levels of development. This is a very good thing for her to have talked about and articulated so clearly. There is much more variability as with each stage, actually. But at the higher stages, the amount of variability, the, the capacity and the choices and range of choices and the freedom to switch from different venues of choices uh, at the higher levels, at the higher range of uh, spiritual development is extremely high. They, people can be very serious and then very uh, happy in, in, from second to second. The spontaneousness of these individuals is very high. So the, the variability, particularly at the very high levels, is quite um, large. And that's why I like to think of it in visual spatial terms, because visual spatial allows me to think in three and four and five dimensional terms, and therefore actually visualize how one level can be exponentially greater than another and then give you more choices and freedom of movement within that particular uh, set of capacities. Another thing I would like to thank Suzanne Cook writer for is to talking explicitly about the social context, so the cultural context in which anyone's development takes place. Development, all development, takes place in a social context, whether it's in the family in particular at the start or in the social historical culture of your time and place. What she doesn't go on to do is to talk about morphogenetic fields which Ken Wilber talks about. In my last video on Ken Wilber, I did uh, talk about and uh, thank him for articulating this so clearly that the morphogenetic field of human consciousness allows certain stages to become more available to everyone as they are articulated in more and more people. So at a certain point, it is able to jump from one level of development to another more easily because more people have enacted that particular form of development. It's very close to what Carl Jung refers to as the collective unconscious, that we can, as people experience a particular archetype or state of development, then that particular state of development becomes more available to other people. And I'd like to see if Suzanne could speculate about some of those things, at least from my point of view, these are really crucial aspects to talk about the relationship between our individual personal development and the cultural context in which we live. Because several hundred years from now, there might be capacities available to human beings that are not explicit or possible for us. We don't know that. We don't know what they would be. We can't imagine what they would be because not enough people have enacted them or even imagined them, perhaps. So these are all important things to think about when we're talking about consciousness, that consciousness um, you know, it occurs at the human level. That is, there is human species consciousness, as I like to talk about it, but also in addition to that, there's a wider frame of reference, which some people refer to as the evolution of consciousness, of which humans are a part. But it, the evolution of consciousness itself is bigger than just the human sphere. But it is the human sphere that we can tap into. So as people enact various levels of development, we can easily interact with those areas of development. And that leads me to my last set of remarks, and that has to do with what I consider two major jumps in development. One of these jumps in development has to do with what I've just been talking about, is that once 
the culture has enacted or the people in a culture or the global community has enacted a particular form of development well enough, often enough, frequently enough in various places around the planet, then that particular development is more accessible to others. In my opinion, as I spoke about in an earlier video, heart consciousness is now more available to more people than it was even 50 years ago, that heart consciousness is simply more available. And the second jump, I think, is as uh, at the very high level, what I call merging with cosmos, that once you go beyond meaning making, you have jumped to a level of human development that is simply beyond what we ordinarily think about as human experience even. They are in a sense a very different kind of human, even though they're basically in, in, invisibly so while walking around Home Depot. Nobody in Home Depot is going to recognize this person as spiritually evolved, even though they may be. They are in a sense, their consciousness is invisible. So, we, we need to think about these morphogenetic fields and the way in which these jumps are changing and moving forward, and also the very possibility that in several hundred years from now, there may be avenues and enactments in human development that we couldn't possibly imagine now. Thank you very much for listening.